Morning, everybody. Morning, Andy. Morning. 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 Matapakapodon, <laughs> Ka whai oranga. Uh, whakapaki atia. From knowledge comes faith. From faith we feel the spirit. From the spirit there is an awakening. From the awakening of knowledge and understanding. The thoughtfulness inspires us from inspiration. To inspiration the work is done. From the work we see the results and the fruits of our labour. From those fruits we have life. Sure. Well, we do have a lot to get through today. I have no apologies, but we do have Councillor Farmer and Councillor Zwin on Zoom. Any declarations on this? No. Okay, we'll go to confirmation of the non confidential minutes. I'm happy to move those. Or second. Seconded by Councillor Gregory. Any matters arising? No? All in favour? Aye. Okay. We have the action sheet. Any questions on action sheet? And the extensive governance group plan as well. Any questions on that? Okay. We have no leave of absence. Acknowledgement from tributes. Um, I'd like to give an acknowledgement to our staff. The last three weeks has been a real massive undertaking, and our consultation meetings right throughout the region have been so well attended by staff and handled so professionally. I'd like to acknowledge that it's been it's been really good to see the professionalism that they have handled themselves in sometimes awkward awkward situations. So thanks very much for that. No public input and petitions. Uh, we do have a motion to accept an item on the agenda, which is. I move. Um, yeah, I, I would like to request whether it is urgent to be at this meeting because it hasn't been considered for very long, even though the content of it is we are well aware of. The consideration of the recommendations is quite fresh, so I just wonder what the urgency is. Can someone give me a bit more clarity what we are moving? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the point. We've got a paper here. Um, confirmation of support will be we priority. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. So is there urgency to yeah. that? Is this meeting without oh, So through the chair, there's, uh, it's not a major it's matter of urgency, it's a matter of follow through on commitment from council made in principle to member. Um, the principles that the iwi had asked us to commit to, so... So I can speak to that on the 8th of... What month was that? February. I had a, a meeting with our iwi chiefs, iwi CEOs, and we were talking about, you know, the way forward, what... So I sent that night an email to every single councillor saying, this is what we um, have discussed if anyone have an issue or questions, please get back to me. Um, otherwise, I'm comfortable to say to Iwi we will support it in principle. So then we had a discussion before then, as all council, and we decided we'll support it in principle. This is now just putting it yes, to... I understand that, absolutely understand that. The question is, why is it a late paper when we did have that lead in time? Yeah. Through the chair, it simply was a matter of missing the cutoff when the docks um, assembler went out. I think it might have even came out the same day. It just missed the timing there. The team 
compiled the agenda, so it wasn't really late. It's not like I think you've received it this week. You've already received the email that was saying I'm to sign it. Uh, yes, Chris. Yeah, um, last meeting where we gave verbal consent, I asked for more information around Three Waters, and I've yet to see any more information around Three Waters. Um, it's not relevant to the question. Just not to do with Three Waters. I don't see why he means. Okay, um, uh, so you're happy to move the acceptance of the I, I moved and seconded by. Uh, thank you. Moved by Councillor Fadigan, seconded by. Councillor Stoltz? Councillor Stoltz? All those in favour? Aye. All right. Notices, motion, June business, no agenda. Okay, we'll get into the submission on the fast track approval of the bill. Page. Um, so one of the latest bits of new le legislation is this fast track approvals bill. There is a nice summary at attachment one, which a legal firm had produced. That's a publicly available summary. So the bill creates a new fast track approval process, largely based on pre existing fast tracking processes that have existed under the RMA for various purposes um, in response. COVID and for other reasons, but it, it takes a wider approach, so it gathers in more approvals, um, for example, um, heritage approval, approvals under the Conservation Act. Um, it also has some changes in that it's got a very clear focus on economic and infrastructure development, sort of putting that paramount above other, other well-beings or outcomes, if you like. So that's a bit of a change to previous legislation as well. Um, so in relation to your previous paper, there had been a commitment to support iwi priorities and iwi had identified some priorities for their perspective for fast track approval. Um, and this so draft submission covers off those priorities. We have, while well, recognising that the fast track approval process may be useful as well for our purposes in terms of uh, infrastructure projects, we might want to progress um, fast. We have identified some concerns with the legislation that have been talked about throughout the sector and, and also by others in the community. Um, so it's a bit of a submission of two parts. It's in support and identifying the types of projects that we have prioritised, but also just raising some concerns with the bill as drafted, but those concerns are covered off in depth by other submissions, such as those by LGNZ Tai Tuara, which is the professional body, and also the recall. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I support our staff's submission in regards to the fast track, um, fast track bill. Uh, fast track will be a slippery slope, though. Like I, I do want it on record that I refuse to support the fast track pro uh, process um, that impacts on our environment. You know, uh, I oppose deep sea oil drilling in our Taira Fiti One. Our official council position adopted in my first term in council was that we oppose deep sea oil drilling, right? Um, my, that was actually my only win in my first term in council. Uh, and I will continue to make sure that we stand by that. The, the issue that I have in regards to fast track consenting is how slippery that slope is to go from economic and infrastructure to also mean economic infrastructure out, out in our oceans. Uh, we heard loud and clear from our Matakawa, Wharekahike and Te Araroa Whanau that they do not want a barge. Uh, I do not support fast track consenting for a barge up the coast. I do support fast track consenting as an iwi priority for housing our people, our cyclone affected people, our flood affected people and for water storage. Everything else really difficult for me to be able to, uh, to support. I feel like that is actually a massive overreach from central government over the top of our own local decision making and a lot of that will get a really hard no from me. But in regards to the submission, I think that it's quite nicely stated these things that are my concerns in a very council specific way around uh, 
uh, issues around uh, the environmental protection and its uh, obligation to Te Tiriti, um, but while also identifying some of the infrastructural things that we would need uh, support in. But again, it's that really fine balance of the regional decision making in order to make sure that that infrastructure is fit for our region in terms of fast track. And I don't see us in that fast track space, but also the possible overreach in regards to things we've already said no to. So I just wanted to put that on the board this time. So I do support this submission. Councillor Oh, yes, th um, thank you. Um, I, I think it's. Um, I'm really proud actually of the GDC for um, making a commitment, having that hui, and then following up with the submission. Um, I think it really goes a long way in terms of building relationships and partnerships with iwi um, and following through on this. The submission itself, I think, um, could use some work. It just feels a little bit light um, for me. Um, one particular bit I just wanted to change here is in the page 26 of the submission itself. Um, where it says the point for voting, the state highway, important state highways in Gisborne, I just want that word changed to Tairapiti or East Coast, whatever is palatable for the current government, um, as opposed to Gisborne because the whole region um, The other part I think is important to note, um, while I really appreciate um, the acknowledgement that there's not enough commitment to the Tiriti, Tiriti of Waitangi um, and environmental protections. I think also the influence of hapu and mana whenua is missing from this space too. The fear is that the fast, fast track consenting will bypass the opinions, thoughts and feelings um, of hapu, <coughs> of whom their role has been kaitiaki over generations. Um, and the negative impact that will potentially have going forward. So while I think fast track consenting in some regards is a good thing, I think that it potentially is overlooking the need for checks yeah, a little bit more checks and balances. Not too many red tapes, but this is too far for me. Yeah, Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I think Josh summed it up quite nicely uh, for me. My, my issue is you, you're take, taking away local decision making uh, like the forestry they, they don't know where all the buildings and where, where the water is soaked up and I see that that's sort of what's happening happening here that they sort of make it sound nice it's for the fast track help etc but the reality is that's not really what it's about it's uh, leave the barge up the coast Etc. And that their, their decisions that should be made locally, they, they shouldn't be made made in Wellington. We live here, they don't be making those decisions. And being, um, yeah, um, the critical thing for me was who's on the expert panel. There's no mention at all who's on that expert panel. If there's iwi representation on the iwi panel, I'm actually quite happy with fast tracking and consenting, um, but. There's no mention of anything about the fast, the um, you know, the um, panel and um, the expert panel. So it's um, yeah, that 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 to me is a critical part of it. And uh, if anyone can tell me who that makeup of that, that expert panel will be, then um, I will be a bit more informed. The people, it is public. It is public. It came out last week. The five people who's on that panel. So the panel that's been announced is the panel that's going to select the projects that get listed in the legislation yeah. if the legislation goes through. The expert panel, in terms of um, deliberating on what gets referred, um, will be decided by the ministers. But local authorities get to appoint one person, and I believe E we get to appoint one person too. So um, there will be some local representation on that expert panel. Right. I think right. it's well, a in panel. Case, then I would support this bill. So, um, yeah, it's, um, that was uh, oh. Councillor Rhea, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Morena Tato. Um, I too share the concerns of Councillor Farihinga and Councillor Prata. Um, it returns my thoughts to um, the incident of fracking of the Rokumara Ranges 
the Matakawa barge wharf situation, and then even most recently to the proposed development of the Buddhist temple here in Turanganuia Kiwa, um, out at uh, between Puhikaiti and um, the Wainui Sponge Bay area at um, Papafariki. Um, issues like this would be able to be, you would, um, under the, the Act or this um, bill, there would be uh, an avenue to bypass and the powers would lie with the three ministers, as I understand it, that even though there is a selection panel, that at the end of the day it comes back to the ministers and it would um, bypass iwi voice, even with one iwi representative voice within um, within that panel, um, there is uh, opportunity that the other iwi within our rohe may not be heard as much. Um, and that's not to also consider that um, hapu voices, um, according to the paper and the legislation, are, are nowhere to be seen and nowhere to be mentioned. I do want to um, thank staff um, for putting this together. I do think, you know, given that the submission is due tomorrow, I do think that it, it, it requires some stronger language. Um, uh, more of a stance uh, of where we're at um, and acknowledgement of the things that have already been mentioned by Councillor Farahinga and Councillor Prata. Um, yes, that's that's all I had to say about it. Kia ora tato. Uh, Councillor Pahu, Huru Mai. Morina tato. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs Chair. Um, Really, just a total for everything that's being said um, by councillors Farehinga, Parata, and Ria. Um, I appreciate the the submission that's been put together. I, as Jeff has said, I think it needs a little bit more strengthening. Um, the the issue between where Iwi sit and where Hapu sit in terms of this bill. Um, um, certainly at this end of the coast, there's large concerns around the, um, the fast track process for the reasons that the other councillors have mentioned. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I, well, I can't support this, the, the, our position as a council if my um, constituents are saying that they're opposed to it. Um, I agree with what Councillor Fadihing was saying about in terms of fast tracking things like housing um, to ha make sure that our, our whānau are, ha are housed um, adequately. That's that's quite a different, whole different kettle of fish to fast tracking other consents like the ones that have been mentioned, deep sea oil drilling, marine facilities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, without um, uh, consultation of um, of the hapu that are immediately affected. So yeah, that's I just wanted to um, to state my position there in terms of um, agreeing with what the other councillors have said in that respect. Kilda. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, I'd like to um, explain my last comment, which sounded stupid. I meant Mana Otawai, not Three Waters, which has yet to be explained to me fully. Um, <coughs> Bill, um, I am I'm not going to vote for it. Um, it's a lead by this government to speed things up. I've been approached by numerous companies that are really struggling because they're coming up against so many consent issues. I have faith that the consenting process can be done well for the environment, but we need to focus on getting things done, and that is what this bill is focusing on. So I'll be voting against. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Thomas. I just want to make it clear what we are voting on today is just a submission. We're not voting, we don't have the option to vote against or for the bill. So I just wanted to make that, that clear as well. And I've got a few questions that I want to ask, even though I had a two hour session about this at our combined meeting in Wellington, even after the two hours of Simpson Grierson, you know, analyzing it, there are so many unknowns still there and I think that is what's causing the unease amongst all of us because we do want to support certain things. All of us want to see transformational projects like housing or water storage or whatever our region as a whole wants. 
I don't think this is applicable to smaller projects like, say, what Councillor Ria earlier mentioned, like, say, the, the, the Buddhist temple or something happening in town. My understanding is that this will be specific projects that will get, get on there. For me, looking at this, this is something that the government is hanging their hat on and they uh, will decide who is on what committee. We've got some input, like um, Miss, Miss Jo said, I forgot your surname. Sorry, Miss Jo. <laughs> anyway, uh, but to me, what we're doing today is saying to the government, yes, you are proposing this bill. We have got some concerns, and the words in the, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively short submission, but we also want to let the government know, hey, we've spoken to our iwi partners, and there are some stuff that they uh, also want to progress, which might be housing or water, things that we might work together with them. So even though we are, in principle, everyone unsettled about that, I am really unsettled about what will be the outcome of this. We also want to make it clear in our submission to them asking our opinions that there might be some good stuff that come out of this if it's done in a proper way. We are not convinced yet that it would be done in a proper way. So I just wanted to make it clear today, we're not voting on the bill, we're just voting on the wording that will go into the submission so that they can see how local authorities at this stage perceive their place uh, or what the feeling is on the ground towards this bill. So I will support the submission because it's important for our voices to be heard. Whatever is in there, and if people do want, I know um, Councillor Ria has asked for it to be firmed up a bit. It's very important that we let them know, yes, no, unsure, because then when the time comes, we can make a verbal submission and maybe by then it's a bit more stronger. So I urge everyone to play your role and make sure our voices go to the government. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I concur with the concerns raised by Councillor Farihinga and Kata and Ria. Um, but I also note this is simply a submission um, in stating our position. I do wonder, though, can this be strengthened slightly, um, particularly with reference to hapu and mana whenua voice? Um, because that is the dichotomy. You've got the iwi voice, the iwi position, but on the ground you've got hapu and mana whenua. So if that was included, some sort of reference to that, Form, I'm more than happy for the submission to go as it, as it is, and I thank you, Joe, and your team, Ms. Noble, um, for your mahi. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> thank you. So the recommendation is adopting the attached draft submission, and uh, I guess we have to agree that we're changing it a bit if we're accepting this draft submission. Uh, through you, your Chair, the changes I heard were this, a change around the wording to refer to Te Rafti or East Cape, not Gisborne, to make sure it's in reference to roading. Um, that the strengthen the wording about the voice or the influence of hapu and mana whenua being missing, um, and strengthening some of the wording about the concerns around environmental protections as well. And there is some wording already floating around in draft from various regional sector submissions that we can lift and use quite quickly. So that's why. Well, so I just wanted to add with the wording stuff around decisions that we had already made yes. as council as well, yeah, like the opposition to deep sea order and things like that. Yeah, um, um, look, I'm all for putting a submission in. I just, um, I just want us all to be aware of why we're actually even having this conversation. And, and the reason is this fast tracking has been brought in is because this country's basically been held to ransom for a very long time. We have not done hardly any major infrastructure in this country for 30 years. They've just got a dam built, just opened recently in, in um, the South Island for um, water storage, irrigation. That's 20 years since the concept was floated. So, you know, if you have a look at what was achieved, and if you drive through the South Island, which I've just been down there, what was achieved 30 years ago is why we've got a country in the economic state we have now and we haven't done very much ever since and we all want everyone wants houses everyone wants a house to live in everyone wants the best roads everything else but we've got to have something to pay for it and, and I think we're just missing the trend. this is about big projects this is not about small projects this is about things that can make a real economic impact for this country and, and, and we're just not doing it so um, yeah I, I think we're just sort of missing the point a little bit going down a rabbit hole maybe that we don't need to.
Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, certainly wanting to reinforce the, the um, inclusion of hapu and manawhenua. I'll obviously support, support those issues. I think in terms of the expert panel, it seems to me that that's a diminishing of an iwi voice. Um, and iwi are, are treaty partners, and they should have their voice, uh, rather than be part of a committee or, or some other panel. And I see the expert um, panel as a dim diminishing of that voice. The expert panel is there for recommendations and there's no rating on what, they, what the emphasis should go on that recommendation. At the Waitangi Tribunal, those are binding recommendations. And, but there's no indication of whether or not the recommendation will come with any priority or status at all. And, and I think so, <coughs> a statement around what is the, the status of that recommendation. And also there's no discussion around appeal processes. And, and I've got to disagree with the fast track because 30 years ago we should have had things in place for that because that simply hasn't worked for iwi or hapu in the past. And the gains that iwi and hapu have made through legislation to get a voice is um, being challenged in this case mm -hmm. with the entirety of this legislation. And um, I feel that the, the efforts that have been made over the last 30 years to install cultural and um, heritage significant values and, and also um, environmental values into our legislation has been impacted upon by this. And we're not, in my view, not discussing that with enough clarity in the submission. It might be a sentence or two. But the, um, over the last 30 years, there has been a massive amount of push from our communities to bring a balance to that. And, um, in my personal view, um, that balance is in, in some jeopardy legislation. Thank you. All right, thank you. We've had a bit of discussion around there. Most of the councillors have had a say on it. I have not had a member of the executive at this stage. Move I'll move it. Yeah. By Councillor Whareyanga. No further discussions on it. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. <coughs> um, Okay. All right, uh, next we've got the confirmation of support for the EU priorities, which is our um, other report. Recommendations on that are to note the council has resolved to support the retention of Mana Otawa and recommends council supports the retention of Mana Otawa and fast track consenting that support Kiwi housing and Liverpool project while also ensuring the fast track regime being without prejudice to the provisions of the Treaty of Waitangi and in looking at our settlements to land there. Chair, where are we? This is what I spoke about yesterday. Remember, there's a paper that's not on our agenda. Everyone is associated with the one we've just done. Yes. Everyone figured out where we are? Yep. Yep. Okay. Councillor Fadi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I 100% support this paper and I'm happy to move uh, the entire thing with one minor edit, which I'll mention at the end. Uh, I've already spoken in support, uh, my support in regards to Te Mano Te Wai and my position on fast track consenting, so I won't relitigate those. I want to speak my support for the retention of Māori wards in general. And not only that, I want to vehemently oppose the re establishment of the 5% poll. It's anti democratic to our local democracy. We already asked our region what they thought. Our council held a massive representation review where the community overwhelmingly supported the establishment of a Māori ward. Fed Farmers' formal submission supported a Māori ward, for goodness sake. Uh, secondly, the opportunity to run a poll was given at the time and nothing was received or submitted uh, because the poll Hobson Pledge tried to run failed. It was a Hobson Pledge failure. That this is supposed to be the government that's about less waste, right? Forcing us to run another process all over again, waste our staff time, and more importantly, waste our ratepayer dollars. The main thing, though, is that we ran a democratic process, and forcing us to run a poll undermines our regional democracy. 
Um, I, I do note that the paper is about moving our retention of, of, of the ward, so I'm happy to move one. I'm happy to move 2A. In regards to 2B, I would like us to change uh, the provisions in, te, in Treaty of Waitangi to the provisions in Te Tiriti or Waitangi, just in order to be able to point at the agreed version of Te Tiriti or Waitangi. I know this isn't about opposing the 5% poll, but it is strongly linked to that. The, the wording in the in the paper strongly links to that. So I did feel that we needed to, well, I personally needed to voice my opinion in regards to that. We ran our process as a council. You know, we shouldn't have to rerun our process again in 2025. The, the request for us to take out something that we already decided through democratic means is actually an undemocratic request, in my opinion. So that's why I'm happy to move this entire paper in its entirety. Put that little te tiriti o waitangi adjustment at the end. Kia ora Second that with the amendment. Anyone else? Councillor Foster. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do have a problem with Tamana Atuwai in court in one, some instances, because nothing is cut and dry. And I, I kind of refer to the Macari Aquifer um, program that we, we just had as far as recharging goes and um, our paper coming up in the future about um, water resources. Because, you know, we've got a, we've got a resource here, Macari Aquifer, which has um, been over-allocated and is declining. And under Tamana Atuwai, the, the, the future would be leave it, decline 15% of, um, of the take and let it um, re regenerate on its own. And we've got, a, we've got a new system now that we can actually recharge this with, um, with the recharge program which, which we've already been through. So that actually, it makes the, the um, original intent of Tamana Atuwai um, Hold, it could hold up some things that a majority of the community would want to happen. So, you know, I, I, I understand why the government is wanting to change the hierarchy a little bit. And um, so, you know, for me, I don't want to see anything just cut and dry. So, no, you can't. I want to see something, well, maybe we can. Um, so I'd just like to put that out there, you know, because um, we are supporting this as a whole. And um, yeah, I'm, I've got some questions. Well, of order, Mr. Chair, we already resolved as a council to support Te Mano Te Wai. That's for number one state. Oh, I've got an opportunity to say. Huh? Oh, um, I I think that Councillor Foster's point is um, is fair. Like I, th I think that it's fair to feel anxious about um, about what the future might be, but I don't think Te Mano Te Wai is a threat to. Um, decision making. I don't think it's a threat to um, looking at innovative ways, scientific ways to increase either the quality of water or the quantity of water. It is about protecting the why itself. It doesn't say that in Te Mano Te Wai, it doesn't say we can't be innovative, but you are right in thinking that I want space for that. So really I think that's a direction for council to continue to engage in that space so that we can, you know, offer what we have, what we know in terms of sciences, that's not iwi space, that's council space. But that's what we offer to that table. And um, and so I support that, that thought, but I also support um, Te Mano Te Wai. Um, and then also I wanted to um, speak in regards to the retention of the Māori wards. Before, the, the previous council made a really brave um, decision to have share this table um, with us and, and, and now that you've got five Māori ward councillors sitting at the table, we do our very best to um, honour to honor that decision. Um, and what we now are saying actually is we like the decision that you made. This is, it's, it's, it's a partnership now. They're saying, we liked that decision. We want you to tell us that you're gonna keep it. This is what partnership is about. Um, and I also agree with um, Councillor Whareihinga that I think it is um, undemocratic of central government to tell us as a region to re-vote something we already voted. Um, yeah, I, I won't speak more on that, but ultimately I have complete faith in our region that we made that decision. If we have to make it again, we will. Thank you.
Cool, thanks, Mary. Yes, thoughts. I think there's a misunderstanding in the community, or maybe people forgot way back when we spoke about Māori wards. Uh, we did community consultation, and our community did have a say, and there were submissions made. Our community did get the opportunity to hand in the referendum under the old regime. regime. Uh, we, we did not receive a referendum from our community in that time to say, we want you to do that. So unfortunately, we are now in a position where the government are just taking everyone who established Māori wards in that time, especially those who, who once the minister said you don't need the referendum, and some were established then, but I think there are about nine councils who are in our position where we did follow the proper process. No referendum was reached. Our community had that opportunity. So I think people forget that just because the legislation now talk about all councils, our community did get that opportunity and we did not receive that in that month. Mm -hmm. So I'm very comfortable to support Māori wards because our community did have the opportunity to come in and talk to us but also when we um, had our hearings and, and our submissions. But on top of that, we did have the opportunity to follow the total process back then. I don't think it's gonna change um, the government's view though. They will still say everyone who established Māori wards in that time, you do your referendum. But I just want people to remember we did have the opportunity to follow that total process. And, and in the end of the day, uh, we did what our community told us was important to them. And we see the lovely contributions around our table now, so, so I'm very comfortable to support that. In regards to Te Mano or Te Wai, it will give us the opportunity to help the look after the water as well while we innovate how we do things differently. So I don't see it as a threat as such. To me, it is up to us to make sure we look after what we have, while we also work with industry, um, iwi, all of us who want to live and thrive in this region to maybe look at different options to get us where there's enough for everyone and we use it in a way that doesn't uh, deteriorate the, the, the quality and the quantity of our water as such. Again, there's the, op there's the chance that the government would just say, the one or two is gone. So for us, we can submit and say we support it, but in the end of the day, I still believe those decisions sit higher than us, but we can still take our community voice back in our submissions and say, this is how, our, how we feel. And also, I think it's very important that we realise we are trying to build relationships in our region as well, and it's important to hear what's important to others in, in our region and take those voices forward. So I'm comfortable with this paper. Thank you. Professor Robinson. Um, we've been provided indications from central government as to how this proposed legislation amendment in relation to the 5% or oh look, um, the 5% um, referendum, generated referendum. Do we know if, for example, in 2025, as is proposed, we are forced to have a referendum and our community says we want to retain Māori boards? Do we know whether there's the ability then at the 2028 referendum for someone to put their hand up in the, in the 2032 and the 2036? Is this something or is it going to be locked in for three years minimum or are three terms minimum? Is there any indication as to, are we going to have to fight fight this clause every three years? You do it, you do it. and it depends on what, how they're going to write the lead. Effectively you do it every six years. Yeah. So it comes into effect in that six years where you resolve to, you know, retain or establish a Māori board. That's under the current system. Um, so you do that, that first and then you do your representation review and whatever changes usually kick in the next, not that cycle, the next cycle. So it really just depends on what they figure out um, through the <coughs> process. But I would not see that you would be able to, like, make a decision um, and that within that triennial for anything to take effect, I, I would think that you'd still have that six yearly cycle. We haven't had any indication as to how that might look, but Not you would I'm take the voice. James, are you more aware of when that legislation might or the bill might come out? Uh, so, indications are around May um, that the bill will come out, and they're looking for an indication in July. 
um, as for the previous legislation that they hinted at returning us to, if you receive a valid poll demand at any time, you, you, you would have to run a referendum. The impact of the results of that poll are statutorily defined. So um, the poll, a poll result is binding on the two elections that come ahead. So if we were forced, if we'd say, let's say we had to do it in 2020, uh, 2025, it would, the result of that poll would be in place for 2028 election and 31. So it is cyclical. Yeah. Yeah. Can anybody provide me with a little bit of back understanding as to why the necessity of the six years to create major discomfort um, and uncertainty for Māori wards? What is the back thinking that allows this to consistently um, put Māori wards under this level of stress and everything? Yeah, well, I mean, it's why, why is there a rationale to have for the only representation arrangement to require a demand poll, to be able to have a referendum on such basis? Yeah. So, they haven't asked for a submission on this? Is this to feed into a submission? or No, at this stage, not yet, but we will be to feed into our submission. Yeah. It's just straight racist. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. It's been uh, council order. Oh, thank you, um, Chair. Um, I'm going to be abstaining from this vote. Um, I think it's been rushed on it. I have asked questions about mana o te wai, and I don't feel I fully understand it. Um, the government, I believe, are only objecting, they, they agree with the concept 100%, they're, I think they're only objecting to the consenting part of it, being given. <coughs> Um, so the reasons I'm objecting is I believe in the democratic process. Central government were voted in by a majority, and it's not my place as an elected local government council councillor to attempt to influence their decisions. Um, we have got enough on our plate. Um, the Maori ward members, I have absolute confidence that they will be voted back in. Uh, you know, uh, in, in our region, definitely. The fast track process, I think it only, well, no, I know, it only applies to um, items of regional significance. And for that reason, uh, I'm fully supportive of, supportive of it. Um, and if you look at what we've just done, we, we've just objected to fast track across the board, and we're approving of fast track for selective issues. Um, well, in a roundabout sort of way. Anyway, I'm um, abstaining. <coughs> Can I just um, make some clarifications? Because it is absolutely factually incorrect to say it is not our job to tell central government. It is 100%. I would say half of my time as mayor is taken up by listening to opinions of my community and then letting the government know how the community feel about that. We make submissions weekly, monthly, to let the government know, because it's their job, just like we listen to Gispin and Tairawhiti people, it's their job to listen to Gispin and Napier and Whangarei people <coughs> and then make sure those voices are heard. So I just wanted to clarify that. It is absolutely our job. You might not agree with what is in the paper, and that's kapai, I just wanted to make sure that everyone around this table know it is absolutely our job to be the voices of Tairawhiti people. Thank you for that clarity. Yeah. Councillor Tupia. I think Her Worship may have stolen my quarter. <laughs> um, certainly our community has spoken and as the voice of their community, we are compelled to, to voice that opinion. And uh, we have been over the stuff and they have told us where they stand. And we, have a, we are duty bound therefore to inform the government that uh, what is the position of our um, community. And that's not to undermine the government, but to ensure that the government is making informed decisions. And we have a duty to do that. And um, to date we have, um, in my opinion, uh, run a very clean and clear process to obtain that opinion from our community, something that the our central government doesn't have a capacity to do. And that's why we exist. And, um, and to assist our government to make better decisions. 
And um, for that reason, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will put the funds through and so that we can continue to do, um, undertake that function as the local authority. Can I be cheeky and have a third go? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to remind you when you're back yeah, up. I know. <laughs> I am, I, sometimes I let, allow it. <laughs> we remember that time back in 2012. Is this new information? Yes, it is new information. So what we're doing in this paper today, we, let's not lose sight. This is us who have met with our partners and we are making, we are supporting what they are doing. In regards to the fast track bill, we will do our own submission as the Gisborne District Council to, is that correct, Nadine? We will also be submitting. Yeah, but will we also for stuff that's important to us, like our own projects that are, we are not already, yes. So the thing is, as a council already, our own stuff are in there as well. So it's not us saying, please support Yui stuff, but don't support anything we want to do. So I just wanted to clarify that as well. That's it. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> right of reply? Right of reply. No, you don't give a right of reply. Right of reply. <laughs> well, no, just to the right of reply. That's a part of you. My right of reply. Um, we, we've had some people in the room say that uh, Māori wards are valuable and that the community will vote for, vote for them again. And I do believe if our region has to run it back, then we will. I believe in our community that we will vote for Māori wards again, but my main point is that our region shouldn't have to. We already did it. Each of us know how frustrating it is for our communities to have to do something again and again and again. It's probably one of our biggest criticisms that we get. Who we again, who we again, engage in this process again. This is if you if if you support the, the five percent poll thing, then you're saying to the community that actually I'm all good with us coming back to you again and again and again. You know, it's it's not great for our community. Like I had said, it's a, the decision made at central government is undemocratic to the decision that we already made in region. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Move on to Councillor Potter Hingis, seeking my Councillor Rock. Councillor Rock, Councillor Rock. 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 Okay, let's go to one annual transformation program. We've got yep. Amy. Yep. <laughs> um, the next reports are all noting, so uh, there is a desire to speed things up that we don't want to get through. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Page 28. Hi, Koto. Hi, Amy. Hi, Amy. Hi, um, I would just like to, happy for you to take the paper as read, um, I just would like to reiterate the acknowledgement in there for our Wainaki Nahiri water team, um, who came only with a few weeks left with us before our water funding comes to an end. And um, while I've highlighted some of the key achievements of the team there, I think what's really hard to articulate in a report like this is the more intangible benefits um, that come from us receiving that funding and having the team on the ground there and you know, the skills and capability building, um, the connection to people for these people and the passion of their work and that has been really obvious to anybody who's bumped into them around the building over the time they've been here. They've always been um, so willing to jump in and help out with anything that needs to be done council and for the community and um, I really appreciate that as well. Thanks Amy. Any questions from the report? Councillor McGreevy. Uh, thank you, thank you for your report Amy. Um, what, what, is there nothing that can be done to, is there no more funding find for those jobs for nature people or and what's the um, next need to do the jobs that need to be done and Wainaki to keep that coming along. Uh, through the Chair, we have not been able to source any further external funding at this stage. Um, as you'll be aware, 
through the Johnstone Nature Programme to extend that funding. We have looked internally at our budgets and we have um, made some proposed changes to our budget going forward that will enable us to retain some of our staff and that our budget is in the three year plan. Councillor Thompson. On page 40, page 40, you're expecting 1.5 Chair, that funding is lots of funding from uh, MPI under the Women Trees Program and from our funding partner One Tree Planted, and that goes towards the cost of tree purchase and planting, which is done uh, by those by contractors, not by our jobs for each team. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I do just want to also acknowledge the Nahiri Order team. But not only themselves, but also the staff that are at Rongo Whakata, we trust our community, <coughs> Rangi Whanau. Like, there are so many um, organisations and groups in our region who benefited from uh, the Jobs for Nature funding. And not only did these people benefit, but so did the, so too did our Nahire, so too did our, our Taio. And it's, it's actually really, really sad. I know our Nahere Order team, they're members of our Nahere Order team that I know personally, and they love their jobs. They love their jobs working out at Waimake. And the reason why I stand is because reports don't talk about how the how much the people loved their jobs. Sometimes I would be out here at the marina car park at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and they're all gearing up to head out there, and they're enthusiastic, they're, they're happy, they're positive. Some of them are looking at, well, those that know me are, are having just that very collegial, friendly chat with me, and then those that know that I'm a deputy mayor but don't know how I know the parts of their teams are going, how do you guys know each other? So um, that there's this really all, real team com uh, camaraderie inside of this, inside of the Ngahiri Oro team, but also an absolute love for the conversations I've had with them about um, about the forest, about the birds that are out there, just them talking to me about all of these different kinds of things and the, the, the rise in bird calls that have been um, happening out at Waimaki. And without those people doing those things, though the health of our ngahere, I'm afraid that those bird calls will start shrinking back down again. Those things that they were helping control out there will start coming back again. All of those pests and things that we talk about in regions so often, pest control, plant control, all of those kinds of things, that will incrementally creep back in again. That's a regional priority because of the nature of us as the East Coast. So I just really feel pody for that team and also pody for our Taiyao as well. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. We have a mover and a second for noting that budget. Councillor Pabahim, Councillor Farada. Nothing further? All those in favour? Oh, a no. um, couple of questions. Um, the total cost to date is 12,200. And there's more costs to go. What's your estimated total cost? Around 18,000. Per hectare? Is that where we're getting? I don't have that in front of me at the okay, moment. Okay, yeah, it's more than 12,200. Um, my next question is, you talk about some areas have been uh, early managed and other areas are more um, let go. Do you have the breakdown of those two things? Heritages. Off the top of my head, through the chair, we have um, Heritage 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 so the actual cost of the actively managed stuff could be higher than significantly higher. Just a point. I just, the last question, how much is it costing the bee people to just plant Monica? Yeah, I don't have those figures. That's a virtually sensitive figure. Like the Lord has expressed an opinion that it's going to be higher for them. Yeah, our plan from here is that we will move to, to 
towards more managed revision rather than net planting. So we've had a strong planting program through the first part of this uh, project, which is focused on making sure that we have treated our ETS liabilities and the risk associated with those, as well as treating highly erosion prone areas around the pipeline and infrastructure. Um, we think that we have achieved the bulk of our planting program now and that we will be able to move towards more managed revision in this new program. All right, that's it. Councillor Farahanga, seconded by Councillor Prava. All those in favour? Aye. Against, carried. Are they moving on to the Oh, I don't see Diana in the room. Is she? Sorry. 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 Yeah, if, you, if it isn't, that's fine. We'll just um, leave it up while I hear or if you want to incorporate community. Yeah, no, if he's available, yeah, we'll get on to him. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so that's report uh, 112103, Community Housing oh, Management so. Plan Update, page 59. And we've got Jeremy Roman, I was going to pop him in. Yeah. Thank you. Floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, Should we run? Um, so we basically talk about the update on community housing and staff housing. Um, obviously, the asset management plan kind of covers a lot of uh, a good overview of it all. Uh, so GHR, we've been managing that since 2016, 2017, um, and over that period, we're looking at the capital investment as well as the R and M and the um, uh, placing of tenants. Um, the overall condition of those those houses are uh, we'd consider sort of B B grade, you'd say. Um, majority of them all have healthy home standard. The um, only one staff house that's not. Um, there's a lot of investment that is needed on them. Uh, moving forward, as you'd see in those numbers that's in the asset management plan, there's some quite large numbers coming up, uh, which is essentially a repercussion of underinvesting in the past. Uh, there's a lot of blazing, roofing, um, it's uh, some of the 50, 50, 60 years old, and they uh, kitchens, roofs, and bathrooms. They, uh, there's no knowledge in terms of plumbing, whether it's all out. I mean, once you start getting in there, those costs can come up. So that is seen as something that's going to come up over the next, um, some in the next three years and some and over the next eight years. There's a, there's a bit of a peak of investment that's needed and then that levels off. Uh, but apart from that, really, if uh, take that forward with the red and then turn it towards Councillor Robinson. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. I have to laugh. Um, page 64 of the report of your, um, page t two of your strategy. Yeah. New variation, the word spelling accelerated. <coughs> Moving on. Um, page 65 of the report. Unexpected spend on careless damage, fire making the property uninhabitable. Is that an example or has that actually happened? Page four, I think, of your. Yeah, there is. Uh, so, with the tenants being, being pensioner flats, essentially, pens it's when those pensions pass away is often when they come up, uh, uh, when they come free. And then at that point, there's a we look at those units at a closer point to get them ready for a new tenant. And that's where some unexpected um, spends come in because we can't predict the numbers. On average, 
there was about seven would come up per year. Over the last two years, there's been 12, 12 each year for the last two, and that increases their unexpected spend. Sorry, sorry, I probably didn't clarify. You've got in this document here, in situations with budget limited, blah, 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 one, semicolon, comma, unexpected spend on careless damage, e.g. fire making the property in, inhabitable, sorry, uninhabitable. Yeah. Um, was there a fire? Yeah, I think it was a couple of years ago, there was a power board that was um, over the local uh, power board that was at the local court. Right. Yeah. The next paragraph is headed unexpected spend, and it says, tenants and units across the community housing portfolio typically change nine times in a financial year. Are you talking about the entire portfolio, there's nine changes of tenants, or each tenancy changes nine times a year? Out of 120 units, there could be nine units that come up over you, so if seven was wrong, the average would be nine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was just um, on page 60, number nine, um, all but one property used for staff housing currently. Uh, this property is no longer being used for housing. Uh, so that's incorrect. It was, um, it's actually, it is still housed as the uh, Morphy Road House, which is, we're currently working with council staff about the future of that house because the, the investment needed to bring it up to a certain to, to bring up a minimum level is really high, and so they are looking at the use of that property and the future of that property. Okay. So very difficult. So it's just kind of a limbo and yeah. decide what's yeah. the best scenario for it. Yeah. So one of those scenarios could the property be sold. So it's a bit yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the average rent is around two hundred and ten a week. Um, and what is the average minimum rate and the percentage in that model rate? It's, it's difficult to establish a good market rate for a single bedroom unit in, in the particular um, suburbs that these are in. So we do use the tenancy website to identify those averages throughout the region and then uh, we put that together send it through to um, council staff to approve or adjust to, to where it should be. Um, and so we aim to get it at 90% of that market rent. So today I can't tell you what the market rent, we, we review that July every year. Um, and so I believe it would be, you know, single bedroom units, I was talking to MSD today, they were saying somewhere at $400, but they also have different quality of what these houses are. Um, so that review will be done in July. Thanks, Matt. Um, I've been around here a long time, and when I first went over to GHL to get Matt Post, who was uh, managing the community portfolio, and one of the things he did with us, we did a lot of work on them, and then we went to the building, and we saw all the units had to be bumped and carpets and, and painted and that. And we were under the understanding that that was a, to a standard, it would have some sort of future. Mm. So I'm always surprised when I go through the GHL and see the maintenance requirements of this portfolio. It seems to be ongoing and for you at a large considerable amount of money. Are there some of those community housing facilities which would be actually better to be dropped because they are so old and because there's such an ongoing commitment to maintenance that it's kind of impractical and there could be another use for that property, i.e. There's a very land shortage and there's a lot of building going on and a much better um, better accommodation option. Yeah, that, that's been discussed um, recently with sort of looking, wanting to review each site by site and how they're operated and then the return on each of those sites was return on value. Um, and that there is something that we're in the middle of doing with council staff to see what we can do. Um, and but to answer that question, maybe there might be some better options there with maybe the less dense sites, uh, to see if we can intensify them more. Uh, but the overall condition, yeah, they're not, yeah, when I say be, those big costs are coming in because there's some big costs of, yeah, you've got 120 units that may need 120, you know, there's 120 kitchens, 120 bathrooms, there's some new rooms. You know, these aren't, these have just been deferred um, over the years. And, you know, we get, Two hundred grand per in two thousand sixteen. It was two hundred thousand dollars for the capital investment, capital improvements. I believe this year it might be two hundred million. So it hasn't increased as costs have increased too. So we're actually it's only going to go backwards if we can't get that. That's a common one for all this question. 
you can't get a bedroom in Brisbane for Lisbon until I know you've got to let alone a bedroom with a kitchen and a toilet. Yeah, mm. yeah that's right. And um, you know, but then there's, it's, and this is where we we book through a, a recommendation on price, but then ultimately come to. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for that, Jeremy. And I think everyone's got a bit of clarity there, so. Uh, uh, a bit of uh, Have a second. Uh, yeah, again. And second. Put my hand up, Josh. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Stop it around. Yeah. Read by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Farringinger. No new report. All, all those in favour? Aye. Uh, uh, carried. I suppose we'd better have a cup of tea. Yes. Right, now we're moving on to the community facility strategy update on page 42. It's just a major report, but that's on where things are at. So uh, look, we just put this paper together to provide an update on the implementation of the community facility strategy, which was adopted in 2018. Um, its, it's overarching purpose is to establish those um, regional priorities and principles for, for our collective effort to improve in community facilities. So it is um, a little bit unique in that space that it, it really draws those threads together between um, community-led projects and council-led projects um, with the basis of a shared direction that we're headed in. That said, the, the context of managing community facilities has changed massively since 2018, and last year we decided it was worthwhile to conduct an internal stop take of that document, I understand, um, and clarify for ourselves exactly how that context has changed, and that's sort of outlined in the paper, um, how we continue to use that document to guide us strategically today, um, and to identify a suitable time frame for a that document, knowing that it's you know, 2018 uh, to be developed, it, it, we're, we're coming into a period of time and we've identified 27, 28 as a time frame to do so. We've also clarified those priority actions for the coming three years because the CFS is a 20 year strategy, 20 plus years it says, um, but we wanted to be really clear on um, how we can most strategically deliver to that strategy in the coming three years, knowing that there are some things foreseeably have resource for or don't have time to deliver in that time frame. Uh, so happy to take any questions, but ultimately it's, it's to provide an update on, on the process uh, that we've run and, and to inform the priorities which sit within the three years. Councillor Parata. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Um, thanks for that. Thank you very much for um, this update. Um, personally, I, I love to talk about community facilities and the investment in those spaces because I think those are the things that make a community and make a space or a place worth living in. Um, I just wanted to get clear, in terms of this strategy, how many of these projects have actually started and been completed? Sorry, and I will just note for the uh, minutes that I'm a trustee of the Whakarua Park and, and participate uh, excuse me, in the grandstand development, but we can talk about the ones that are not that one. Mm -hmm. so the chair, I wouldn't have the exact number that have started or been completed. Um, there's a list of, of those uh, which have um, the, the, the most noteworthy projects which have e are either underway, funded, or completed um, somewhere within the report here. 2016, thank you. Uh, there are a lot of smaller actions which are captured in that, which are as simple as council developing a document or a I wouldn't have the number to add exactly um, what number has been uh, implemented. Can I have a supplementary question? Um, it's council also funding or part funding some or all of these projects? Through the chair, council is uh, part funding. Well, council has a, a level of investment in some projects, uh, but yes, it varies depending on their scale and, and nature. Generally, the, the priority infrastructure projects, which are within the um, the list of ten priority projects from the strategy, uh, council council have either partially funded or not been funded. Depending on the nature of the we've 
had a significant funding role in the Kiwa Pool through development. Uh, other projects like the escape. Um, <laughs> CT was trust tied up to the time that was Page 44, uh, third point from the bottom, <coughs> refers to the construction commenced on the redevelopment of Rugby Park. I understand that the new turf there is going to be a very high standard and has a water demand of about 16,000 litres a day for its irrigation to maintain its standard. Have those um, needs and, and specifications been run past council as far as you're aware and are we working hand in hand with, it, with that development? And the reason I ask that question is in the back of my mind I'm thinking repurposing water from a particular property in Pack Street is not very far from Rugby Park. Um, but 16,000 litres a day at the wrong time of the year could be a challenge. Absolutely. Uh, we, we have had a role in um, providing some landowner approvals for the Rugby Park um, project, which have generally been um, in relation to more of the infrastructure of the grandstand itself. The, the water tank is managed through a consent. Um, there, there would be uh, an allowance of a consent. Consent and, and applied for one, and then there's the other one that has been replaced by. Maybe something to keep your eye on. Um, and then on the line, we have a large group of members talking along the lines of the playground network plan. We had a playground out there that overnight, half of, more than half of it disappeared. Uh, we had a castle there with a slide and a a tunnel that the kids used to play through, so that disappeared overnight. Um, the word was that there was maintenance issues, which no one could see. It would be in very good condition. But the problem at that time, two and a half years ago or something, was that it was a, to be replaced or upgraded, that, but nothing's happened there. So how does the playground, playground network plan prioritise getting things done? And yeah, probably the question from the community is pretty grumpy about how they've lost all their playground facilities in, in that area of Wine Pool. Yeah, our, our two priorities for asset planning presently are playgrounds, network planning, and, and public convenience network planning, and those are the two areas we're waiting for. Um, we have some of our, our highest risk as an asset manager, and, and we want to move from um, reactive renewals when, asset is, when assets are failing to proactive renewals when we know that assets have reached or are nearing the end of their useful life. To, to be able to do that, we have the uh, resource that we have. Um, we first start with a network planning process. Uh, there, there is still an increased, in both cases, an identified increased level of resource that are required to get us to a point where we're proactively renewing those sites um, but we're certainly coming from a place of, of having assets fail and having to respond reactively, which is not what we're looking for now. But is there a priority list of how that work gets done? Yet? Some companies are getting new playgrounds, but others are getting theirs taken away. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in both cases, the approach would be to uh, schedule those renewals based on the expected value of those assets and then the scale of that. <coughs> um, how important the site is. Um, so the network plan is absolutely considering sites like that one um, and, and how that's addressed into the future. We, I think it's also worth noting that we uh, had some really significant challenges with um, aspects of our use <coughs> and, um, and the flooding of the botanical gardens playground, which really did affect our capital budgets over the last two years. And so we didn't deliver service as normal by any means, and, and there were projects that were planned that went undelivered or reprioritised to, to meet. All right, thanks, Vic. No more? We have, uh, we have our meeting seconder, Gregory, and Councillor Parata.
good? Who would like to fight it? Aye. Aye. Against? It's carried. Next one. Uh, Rethos Consents Overview. Who's that? Rethos Consents Overview. Sunday Orders or Katrina Bay. I have a couple of the team here to support today as well. Morena Tato, this is an information report. It's an update and an overview of how the resource consents team is tracking. I know that resource consents is something you often hear about as governors and it's something that touches many people in our community, whether they're urban or rural. Um, I'd like to introduce Sonia and Catalina. Um, they undertake an important role in our consents team, a couple of new roles that we created. So Sonia, August focuses on our systems and purposes processes and sort of that continuous improvement within the resource consent team. And we have Katharina Maka, who's our Māori engagement officer, so working really closely with our mana whenua partners, both in terms of how they input into the consent process, but how we take into account their views and values in the consent process as well. So they are the authors of this report. Um, so they've highlighted how the team's working, Updates on a few sort of consents of note that you may be hearing about in the community, just to give you an overview of where those are at, and an update on how the team is fulfilling its commitments to TTIT partnership. So they're here to answer questions on the detail, um, but I'll take it as read and over to you for questions. Thank you, Jan, and welcome to the new team members. Councillor Robinson. Yes, thank you, um, new team members. Thanks for the report, and it's actually Really great to see in a report form that these positions uh, has made a change and is making a change and it's it's really proactive and it's forward thinking and it's progressive and it's great to see our council um, doing these things. Um, just a few questions on page fifty one at paragraph four. It talks about prolonged absence of leadership from twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three um, as a resourcing challenge. That, that's been resolved, though, hasn't it? So, page 52, paragraph 8, the section is working collaboratively with the Council's finance team to identify, address and close processing gaps currently contributing to undesirable cost recovery efforts. What is an undesirable cost recovery effort? Does that sound like pouring money in a hole? So through you, your Chair, we have sort of targets for our cost recovery and sometimes we're not making those targets, so that's what we're trying to address, make sure we are getting as much cost recovery as Council is anticipating when it sets its budgets in the long-term plan. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes things like not having to give discounts for late consents, for example, it's just making sure our processes are really yeah. as good as they can be. Sure. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, paragraph 21 on page 55, which deals with um, cultural impact assessments. Five active deferred applications of IAPU catchment are awaiting cultural impact assessments, which has caused some delays. Are those delays caused by us or the applicants? Our three chair, it is um, a mixture of both. Um, so you, you would note in, the, in that information that there is a, a lack of CIA writers available. Um, there is, I guess, a lack of a guide or a practice on what's an appropriate or a, um, you know, what constitutes a good CIA. Um, and then also there is, I guess, not much in terms of understanding like how we can implement it as well in the decision making. So that's where we're focused on a lot of our, um, our training and our development in those areas. So if I'm understanding this correctly, these applications are to do with gravel extraction from the white group? And this is um, important, obviously, for our, our roads and our communities up there. Um, and this has been in front of us a number of times. Uh, this, this feels like rinse and repeat. Um, so I'm thinking, looking at this, going, we need to take ownership of this. We've got some part done, some not part done. We've got five entities up there. Um, we need to close this off. So I'm not sure how you do it, but I strongly encourage us maybe to take the lead and work with 
applicants to, I don't know, get someone specific because it's going to be a very similar application I would have thought for the CIA mm -hmm. if it's all about taking gravel from the same area. Um, anyway, I just, yeah, I'd like to see some conclusion on that, particularly for our business, our, our applicants up there. This is an ongoing stressful situation for them, I imagine. Um, last one is page 57. I always get excited when I read the section called legal. Um, several legal implications have been raised in this report. Um, what legal implications have been raised in this report? I couldn't actually sort of identify them. Paragraph 57. Uh, 50, uh, sorry, pa paragraph 34 on page 57. Review, Chair, it was really just um, referring to the fact that everything, all the decision making falls under a legal framework being the Resource Management Act. There aren't any, and sorry, maybe the wording was a little bit um, clumsy, there aren't any direct legal implications from this report that you need to be aware of, but we are working within the Resource That's what I wanted to know. Thank you, Ms Noble. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Councillor Ferrata. Um, I'm really heartened to see the movements um, in terms of consenting um, for our interpretation of treaty partnership mm -hmm. and um, cultural impact. I, I really, um, it's really heartening to see a space that we've traditionally been locked out of um, to now have a, um, our own influencing that space and setting the narrative for it, I think is um, leaps and bounds, probably ahead of other council. So I'm really pleased to see um, that being influenced um, here and in your team. Jo, so I'm a Hindu to you and your crew. Um, I just wanted to touch on, no, and also the training that's happening for other members of the team. That's good stuff too. Like long may that reign and I hope that that happens in other spaces too. But to see it happening and consenting is a choice. Um, but what I wanted to pick up on was um, Te Ara Tipuna. Um, and, and notably how complex I think that particular piece of mahi is, how it spans over three, three territories. Mm -hmm. three, three territories, um, and, but I think that that, what am I trying to say? I think that that mahi will be legacy work for the council. It'll be the kind of thing that we'll all be able to look back on and think, wow contributed to such an amazing an amazing piece of work. So I just wanted to acknowledge that that's not an easy, it's not easy undertaking. It probably would have been easier to turn your turn away from it. And not, and not look, yeah, look it's, so, it's so hard and so complex, it probably would have been easier to pretend it didn't exist. But I just wanted to acknowledge that um, it's a hard piece of work. Your team are getting through it. It's legacy work. I'm really um, heartened to see it represented here at this table. And, yep, that, those are my only thoughts. Oh, and sorry, there was one more thing. One more thing. I think if there's ever an opportunity um, for perhaps these advisors to um, to take on an intern um, of some kind, even for a summer or for a short period of time, I think that would be really valuable um, in Te Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, support what um, Councillor Parata was just talking about. That is really exciting, that um, Tiara Tipuna Trail, from what I've been reading about. And um, so that's cool. But also on the Waipu catchment, um, I went to the science thing um, that they had here earlier in the year, where we had scientists from all over the world talking about um, river systems and and many of them have studied the Waipu and they, if, if the only thing they brought up was um, the fact that taking gravel from here affects there and that must be a big priority and I'm so, I am stoked that you're taking the time to consider all these things and I know that that equipment is difficult to move around to do this um, graveling stuff, but um, it seems like that's the only way to do, to look after that hour. So thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Yeah, just one point on that, on that trail. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. If you just want to post, I want to know, I've had quite a few people come to me and get really upset about it. 
how, how dare someone propose a track through their property and, and they haven't, haven't even spoken to them about it like cheekily. So, so there is a lot of angst. I just want to note there is a lot of angst against that they post there, how it's sort of like, how it's like me putting in a consent on someone's property that I don't own. I've got an answer for that. Uh, you'll get to yeah, oh, I have an answer for his specific question. Yeah, okay. Um, the proposed trail, as far as I'm, I'm aware, because I've been to a couple of their community meetings, it's just the proposal. The, the landowners do not have to engage, they don't have to agree. Those consultations are continuing to happen. If they decide they don't want it, the trail will be re redirected. redirected. There's no pressure for anyone, but in order to start the process, they had to do a basic trail. So there's no pressure for any landowner, Māori general, otherwise they will redirect the trail. If, if whānau don't want it through their whenua, those engagements are happening one-on-one -on -one with whānau and with trusts. I've been to a couple of their community meetings and that has been reiterated over and over again. There's no pressure. But in order to start this process, they had to do a draft. Thanks for that clarity. Mm -hmm. Councillor Tilly. <coughs> Ina Gote, this is a very exciting piece of work. Uh, wonderful to have you installed to advance uh, truly needs to put Mataranga Māori in a space to be understood through our legislation. Um, the points I want to come to is number 18, uh, which speaks to the three councils. Um, are you working collaboratively or by yourself with the other two councils in order to manage the scope of this work? Through you, Chair, um, yes, um, absolutely, 100%. We are working collaboratively with the other councils. We're meeting with them regularly, regularly at this point. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely, we're collaborating with us. I'm sure those because the, the council is leading it ultimately because um, the trail traverses, the majority of the trail traverses our um, region. Um, um, in relation to that and bringing it to the cultural um, assessment, cultural impact assessments, um, how are you thinking about managing cultural impact assessment in relation to Daratipuna across those three territories? Um, through you, Chair. The applicant provided a cultural impact assessment with the application, and within that uh, CIA, they proposed. Um, an engagement um, process uh, with each of the EU possible, um, including those customary rights and those under the NACA as well. So um, they have given a framework as to how they would engage themselves, but we have our set protocols of how we would, um, you know, specifically to the, our statutory requirements. Um, and through that, it is through our own um, assessment of who we would who we engage with, um, we also will be providing that as well through what we call Section 92 or Commission request. Um, for the most part, we would expect the applicant to be um, an application of this size um, and magnitude that would be a huge task on its own. That would be a huge task. So through the notification process, a lot of it would be um, managed there, and through the CIA that they propose, um, they also want to be able to do that post-decision post, post as well. Um, but we would expect that and we would inform, engage, and notify our iwi and hapu, as well as those that we have to under the Māori Moana. <coughs> There's a couple of things here. Um, so firstly, you're developing your own technical understanding of CIAs, mm -hmm. and then of course there's the CIAs in relation to the point at source and the actual hapu that have that. So the hapu requires CIAs too, mm -hmm. and you've got CIAs, so <clears throat> there's a space there for another dialogue to occur. 
I'm referring specifically to point 21, which talks about deferred applications in the way up. Mm -hmm. And I have to state my um, own father, my brother, has had his business quite um, severely disabled as a result of the lack of CIAs happening. But my question is, <clears throat> um, you're building workforce, and that workforce sits in here. I wonder, um, one of the main things about uh, treaty assessment work that's been clear to me since we've been put into space is that you have a desire by iwi to be involved in these processes so that they can facilitate legislative requirements and let business go forward. But there is little resource that iwi actually have to be able to build their own workforce capacity. And I know you have other streams where that capacity happens and you get the training here. My question is across the seven um, water catchments um, in relation to these kinds of assessments, are you considering who are the right people to um, bring in so that you can build workforce capacity in the name of the hapu or the iwi there? And then of course the other part that I just want to add to that is, is any of 21 and the matters discussed in there having a um, impact of any kind upon the JMA with the Waiapu and the fact that um, neither parties have actually progressed over the last three or maybe even four years. The business and how does this work um, assist that agenda? Let <coughs> me chair, there's a couple of questions there. So firstly, um, around building the workforce. Um, initially, we needed some more inward best practices as well. Um, through my role also I'm initiating an outreach training project and through that going to Iwi and Hapu and um, tailoring a training that suits them that are based on the areas um, of significance and areas of interest and specifically CIAs is one of the most interest of Iwi and Hapu at this time. Uh, so I'm be facilitating some training that's built around Iwi and to build that workforce as well. And that needs to be a regular, regular training um, regime because we know the turnover of whānau. Um, in terms of the impact on the JMA, yes, there is an impact. Um, for the most part, we've only had one this JMA hearing and um, that was a result of a gravel extraction um, application. And that same applicant is one of the applicants in Hapu And they prefer not to go down the JMA um, I guess pathway again, they'd rather make sure that they get it up front um, and through this process rather than go through this uh, hearing, full hearing. And for all applicants, they do recognise and acknowledge that importance of cultural, understand cultural values and importance on the way up um, and uh, spending a lot of their time doing this. So there's a bit of capacity building in that UN hub that needs to, um, to be met in order to support producing the CIOs for the app. And then on our part, it's the building our capacity to understand how to interpret it and not misinterpret it when we're making decisions. So there's a bit of a circle um, that we, we're trying to support. Koto, mm. that's excellent, thank you. Councillor Palmer, thank you very much, um, Mr Chair. Now this, this um, uh, conversation that just occurred just really highlights the the importance of having uh, capability around this level but also having that almighty capability inside of our teams it's been one of those dreams and discussions like from my um, earlier terms in council in regards to uh, being able to get here to the space still got some uh, runway to to occupy but man this is uh, in stark contrast to some of the earlier conversations I was witness to um, the the capability inside the team gives me the assurance that um, we're speaking to the right whānau, we're speaking to the right hapu who speak, or the right people who speak on behalf of those hapu, because there have been some of our whānau that have engaged in this place and put down their, their hapu members, but then it's been received as that that was the hapu voice. You know, that these kind of little meaningful interactions that kind of just get slightly. Uh, uh, taken out of skew, so I'm, I'm so assured by having this capability inside of the treaty. I just wanted to ask a, a, a question 
also in regards to Te Ara Tipuna around um, um, paragraph 18, just in regards to the publicly notified part of it, because this is such a huge kaupapa, when do you think the public notification part will come in? I guess it's just to try to speak to the points that Councillor Thompson brought up and also Councillor Paratsa brought up. There is a corded all that's happening in regards to this project and the community. So how is, do we have an estimate in terms of when public notification happens? And I guess just for the table, are we able to kind of just give a little brief as to public notification when that closes what? the other public engagement processes will be. Kia ora. Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, kia ora. Um, we don't currently have a time frame for when the notification is going to happen, but those discussions are ongoing and being negotiated with um, what's suitable um, yeah, between the planner and the applicant. Um, in terms of the public notification process, um, for this particular application, the uh, um, the applicant has requested the application be publicly notified. Um, and um, generally this is assessed by the planner um, where the assessment of the application um, results in effects to the environment that are more than minor. Um, yeah, so um, what occurs within the public notification is that um, um, a, a, an assessment of the application will result in a, a number of directly affected parties who will be served notice um, on and um, be able to make submissions, but also that um, in terms of public notification, it will be in the newspaper, so it's open for yeah, basically the entire community and beyond um, to make submissions uh, on the application. Thank you very much. Councillor Telfer. Um, yeah, um, <coughs> Yon Court. Um, I, I find this quite frustrating personally. Um, we have been here discussing consents and these are renewing consents, these are not new consents up for metal extraction up the coast. Um, and these are people that have got businesses and livelihoods and mortgages and employing people. And, and I just do not think it's acceptable that we can sit here and have another talk fest and in the meantime these people are carrying on position that they're in. Three years, two and a half to three years to get an existing consent renewed, it's just ridiculous. And, and if we don't do something about this, people are going to walk away from this district, take their businesses somewhere else. Um, so we need to address it. We need to make it an urgent thing that we're going to address to be able to tell them that we are actually going to do something about it because it's not acceptable. And, and if you turn around and put, anyone puts themselves in their position, um, you know, they've invested years the years of their families, they bought houses in the areas. Um, they need to be taken seriously. These are ratepayers that we're supposed to be representing. So, look, I, I, I'm, yeah, we, we've discussed this. Um, it's, it's come up many times and we don't seem to be getting any. So I, I want to make a real priority here because to be fair to them, they've waited long enough. Chair, just to clarify, if it's renewing existing consents and they're not changing what they want to do, then they can continue to operate under those existing consents while the renewal process is worked through. In terms of why um, some of these consents have not been progressed faster, it's because, of, as Maka noted, the applicants don't want to go to a hearing. So that means they need to continue working with the, with the parties to show that the effects are minor. And that's a choice that the applicants are making. We could proceed to a hearing and get a decision, um, but they don't want to do that. <laughs> if there's nothing further, it's just a note in the court. Moved by, moved by Councillor Gregory, seconded by Councillor Tibble. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Uh, earthquake prone buildings, and we've got the end of the kitty at the moment. Mysterious. Mysterious, Mr. Pitti. <laughs> Interestingly enough, as I was walking out the door this morning when the news was on at 8 o'clock, there was an announcement about earthquake crime. Um, can I say this one? <laughs> I will hand over to M. Pathy. I'm sure you've all met him before, Manager of Building yeah. Services, and a wealth of information on earthquake crime building. 
Okay, so just a brief um, synopsis of the report. Um, we've had two uh, um, New Zealand leaders in um, earthquake prone strengthening. We started in the, um, in the late 80s, issued notices in um, starting about 93 through 95. Uh, then we had a whole, then the legislation changed and we had a whole lot of children drop out because they changed the definition from earthquake risk to earthquake um, prone. Earthquake risk was could suffer damage, earthquake prone was suffer catastrophic collapse, which was obviously a higher test. Um, but luckily we kept all those records because when the Act changed again in 2004, um, that definition um, included those buildings we dropped out. Um, so we've kept um, our foot on the accelerator as much as we can to get those buildings um, strengthened. Um, we're well on the way. We were looking at having finished, would, that we'd be finished by 2027. However, um, this morning the government announced that they're giving a four-year extension um, for all um, buildings that haven't passed their, um, their end date. So we've only got two buildings, are the um, group of buildings um, where Shoe Envy is and um, in between um, Perfect Roast and um, where the flight centre used to be. And, um, those buildings are not earthquake prone, but they do need some minor parapet strengthening. So they're low risk, but it still needs to be done. Um, so we'll push that, and they should be done within the next few months. Um, but it really was disappointing for me that I thought we were going to be finished by 2027 and now we won't. And I mightn't be here by the time. Enjoy it, Ian. Who will you, Thanks, Ian. Well, thank, thank you, Ian, for your team's work and thank you for your work personally. Um, I'm happy to move the paper. Thanks. Um, there was. Uh, Quite a bit of news last week, I think, that was on talkback about how heritage was affected in earthquake. So you've got a building that's earthquake risk, the owner hasn't got the resources to improve, but he can't do it under a heritage listing, so he couldn't demolish either. So these buildings were actually a hindrance to the environment and everything. Have we got any issues like that in, in here? Where the main building is, um, I guess, is. And what was Scotty's um, thing? You know, it's a lovely building. Um, it was due to be um, its final date of February 2025. And now the owner's got an additional four years. Um, that's been, I went in um, last week, it's been beautifully finished inside, but I know there's some issues with the license, but that had to be worked through. Uh, it would be a real shame to see that building come down. Very, very nice building. It's nice inside, it's nice outside. Um, but um, speaking to the owner, he said that um, most of the work needs to be done upstairs on the brick, um, brick walls up there, and that can be done without dis disrupting any operation that may be in the bottom. Any comment on the site? Status of the Masonic? Uh, the Masonic is not earthquake prone. Um, so the Masonic was assessed um, a number of years ago as about 45% of new building standard and we took it off the register. It's sitting there not improving at the moment but unfortunately it's one of those buildings that's um, partly owned by the prince and partly owned by the, um, the owner and until that is sorted um, no one will, you know, it, I've tried to push things on other buildings before and the police don't really want to know because they don't know how much of it they're, they're going to own. The owner doesn't want to do anything much because he doesn't know how much he's going to own and we're not really sure who the owner is. But they're, they're just in limbo. Okay, and the other thing, I was just want to endorse your keeping the pressure on with the parapets because that is where the lethal aspect of earthquakes is. You're walking on a hook up the parapets on the head. So yeah, I'm going to support that. Councillor Foster. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going back to the tower building and the Masonic and all that, I mean, this is the future of the CBD. You know, these buildings are so critical about um, for the future with the, uh, the internal apartments and everything. So it's really disappointing to, be, to, to think that we've been held to ransom um, between the police and the owners and not, not everyone is putting their hands up and can't do anything. You know, 
um, you know, I, I just want to reiterate how important for the future of the CBD these buildings are, and being just left in limbo is actually catastrophic. And 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 um, you know, how long is this going to last? You know, it's it's just ridiculous. It's crazy, and the government or someone needs to step in and um, assist this because, you know. I think our CBD is at a really critical stage at the moment. We, it's not looking pretty. These buildings, these three buildings and the tower building are, are so critical to the future of it. So, you know, I'm, I'm so disappointed that I keep on reading. Um, you know, we've been over this for years and years. It's um, been like this for the last three, four years almost, and we've still got no progress whatsoever. It's so sad. Um, I just can't emphasise enough the importance of these buildings for our future. So really yeah, I think that's a very good point because um, certainly the real estate firm that's um, looking at the Masonic building have said that they could sell it tomorrow yeah. um, for it to be developed into apartments. Yeah. So yeah, it is very sad that that's not happening. Yeah. And when you see apartments like the ones that have been developed in half the country, what the heck, um, there's, you know, it'd be great for um, more inner city living. So yeah. Keep the responsibility. I, I thought I'll just put a little bit of uh, perception, or oh, perception is not a good word, context around the extension we received because I'm sure everyone, like myself, forgot that we supported a remit from the Manawatu yeah. District Council in May last year when they submitted at the local government New Zealand conference for the government to give some of these regions a bit of extension. So I just want, I, I have forwarded the email to you that I received last night. Um, so just to put a bit of context there, we were part of, of a group that said to the government, can you take a look at it? Because it is a massive issue in lots of towns. So I thought I would just let you know we were part of that. We usually don't see such fast action though. No, no. <laughs> we have done lots of remits. So kai to the government for, for listening to the remit from local government New Zealand. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for that. Papers moved by Councillor Robinson. Seconded by Councillor Robinson. It was actually moved by Councillor Robinson. It was actually moved by Councillor Robinson. Yeah. Moved by Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Foster, because he loves to move stuff. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, we've got public excluded now, so um, yeah. Public excluded. Um, yeah, probably could have a little bit of discussion. It seems a bit unfair on yes. Council of Foster that he's going to be incredibly rushed yeah. in this component of the meeting. Oh. Welcome to the infrastructure side of our operations committee meeting this morning. We have no apologies. Uh, we've got Councillor Pudu Pudawai and Councillor Ria. They'll be attending via audio visual link. We've got an apology from Councillor Ria. From the count oh, there's apologies from Councillor Ria. Okay. I'll move that. A second. In favour? Aye. Aye. There's no declarations of interest. Confirmation of environmental uh, minutes on page four. Moved by Councillor Bradley. <coughs> Bishop, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Action sheet, it's on page six. No confusion on that. Comment? <coughs> Work plan on page seven. Everyone's happy with that. No leave of absence, no acknowledgement and tributes. Public input and petitions. We did have one, but it was um, withdrawn. Extraordinary business. No notice of motion, return business. So we're going to straight to page 11 for three waters infrastructure project update. Tim here and uh, Leo. Right. Leo to, to Leo. Thank you. Leo 
questions, maybe? Yeah, um, so this report is just a, a high-level um, progress report on our three waters infrastructure projects um, for this financial year as they currently stand. So if you're happy, I'll take the report through and then just respond to any questions. Any questions for Leo on this? Maybe. Second. Oh, I'll text me to Dick. I think it's just you, Tony. Angry. Just the um, like trunk main span refurbishments. Um, is, um, is that actually necessary at this time, or is it part of an annual I'm just looking at that going, is it actually affecting the structural soundness of the line in a time when we um, How many kilometres do we have of that Wainaki pipeline? 28 kilometres of pipeline. <coughs> uh, pipeline is built in about 1960, I think. Our assessment of it is it is actually pretty good material, but you need to put some love into it. So our um, proposal is to work on the science of that pipeline so we can potentially get another 30, 40 years out of that. Um, that won't be a job that is done in one single year. It'll be a job that we intend to do. Um, you never really stop on, on that pipeline. So a, a really important part of resilience is always doing something with your assets. Uh, so the capital we are spending on this is minor capital. Uh, I'll give you a, a replacement idea. We're talking $100 million if you replace that pipe, which is absolutely unaffordable. So we actually want to keep that up. Um, identified from that pipeline is um, the 1960s steel that was pumped out of New Zealand is quite good quality. Um, but we've got Gibbold joints along the length of it. Um, they introduce a, a weakness. Uh, over time, the gaskets around them get uh, really firm, or basically chipping. It doesn't do a flexible job. So we're, we're slowly wanting to program over a decade or so just a rehabilitation of that pipeline. So uh, it can give us decades more service. Uh, so, uh, going forward, we'll be always looking to be upgrading this pipeline because we've got 38 kilometres. Yeah, you do this room refurbishment is $1.6 million per kilometre. There's 250 metres, is 400,000, the budget's 400,000 for 250 metres, so $1.6 million per kilometre. This is an exposed section of the pipe. A lot of it's buried. So this is one that's exposed to the elements, so addressing it is, is um, of a greater importance um, as opposed to, to uh, We're also going to be relooking at that methodology because mm -hmm. we're thinking of cutting out the gibbolts and, and putting weld bands in and, and changing the approach. Uh, here, this is a Chernobyl where we're actually wrapping the thing. Um, and uh, we're, we're uh, in, in uh, put, yeah, we're wrapping it and grout filling it. I think uh, we've had some recent advice uh, on changing that approach. Uh, but something, uh, something all the time is quite important on our assets like that. Mm. So our uh, it seems a lot per per kilometre. Yeah, when you're only refurbishing, you're only giving it maintenance up. No, no, that's a good call. So we'll go and have a look and happy to find some, uh, happy to have you, happy for that challenge. Councillor Robinson. Um, paragraph 16 on page, paragraph 16 on page 16. <coughs> um, talks about the water supply upgrade, the southern Taruheru water main extension. The concept design has been completed, um, final design has been done. Um, 
given we have spoken in this room about the potential for development out Hexton Way in the future, um, will that pipeline going out to Southern Taruhiru um, be future proofed or will it really only just meet the needs of the Taruhiru block development and nothing beyond that over the next 30 years or 20 years? Because I'd like to see it obviously future proofed. We'd have to dig it up at the cost of millions of dollars per kilometre and replace it with a bigger pipe down the track. It is based on future proofing. So it is of a size and, it, and it's a way of ring maining the whole network as well to uh, equalise pressure across that network to enable um, the forecast growth in that area. Uh, next question is page 20, uh, which is paragraph 39. Uh, just said that a contract was awarded on the 7th of December. Contract work resume in January 24 and expected to be completed by the end of March 24. We're now April. Did it resume in January? Did it complete in March? That's the Douglas Street stormwater project. Yeah. Didn't quite complete in March, it has been completed now. So just, just drifted into April, but it is completed. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I just want to refer this to page. Um, I just want to understand, like, can you explain to me how they're serviced? I don't get it. A service by a low pressure, on demand, triple G water scheme into private rainwater tanks. Is that like rain? Are we talking about rain or no? We're talking about something else. What the system in Tikaraka is, is the bulk of the system is, is based on a rainwater system for the houses. So they have their tank, rainwater from their roofs goes into their tank, they've got that. Council has got a supplementary system, uh, program to that where we're drawing water from the river, from Bull River. Um, it is goes through a, a treatment process to produce water that then goes through a low pressure system that delivers designed to about a thousand litres a day to, per property to trickle feed into the um, the rainwater tanks to top them up. How, does get, how do they get to the their tanks? It's a low pressure system, so it's through pipes. Through pipes? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so mm -hmm. the, but it's not a it's not a mains pressure reticulation to the plumbing of the building, which would then invite filling. Um, that's interesting. I didn't know you guys could do that. <laughs> <laughs> now that I know now that I know we can do that. There will be other places that need this. But um, so thank you for explaining that to me. Um, I think it's important that when I don't when we don't understand what's being said that we just ask outright because then that creates opportunities for us to think about what might be possible in areas like Te Karaka, who also want low pressure on demand trickle feed water scheme into rainwater tanks. Um, but also I just wanna, I wanna know, is that system, are we trying to upgrade that system and that's currently on hold? Are we trying to make it better? We want to make it better. The reticulation system requires upgrading, so replacement. Um, to improve our level of service so that the pipes are old, so we need to replace them. So that program is all planned and ready, but um, we've been very um, conscious of what's going on in Tikaraka and making sure that that work program is um, works in, in, uh, in, um, in with the other programs that are going on, so we're not causing an issue where actually it's a positive um, project that we're, we're doing there for the have you received feedback from the community at Tikaraka that they don't, this is not a priority for them? No, what we have done is the project is ready to go and that's just been worked through. And the next engagement is with the community just to make sure that that's fitting with everything else that's going on there. Okay, and when is that going to happen? When is the engagement? It's happen within the next couple of weeks. Oh, excellent. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. The engagement. Yeah, just a supplementary of that, I'll just, um, when we supply potable water to houses, we've got a huge responsibility then to the health of that water, and that's why we treat it through the treatment plant. But this is kind of indicating that we're putting 
our water into their water. So if something did go wrong, or engineers bombed the water, who was ultimately responsible? Because it could be 90% their rainwater at the time, or it could be 90% our water at the time. How did that come from? You, you, uh, arguably, you could get into an argument about that, but it's going to be the roof water, unless you can prove otherwise. So that these treatment barriers at the treatment plant. Um, um, can I just say this is an imperfect solution? You have a treatment plant treating water to a certain level, and then you're adding it to rainwater that comes off a roof. Yeah. So, so it's not the answer uh, that people need ultimately in our communities. Uh, but um, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it, academically you could get into a, um, a a blame game about where the issue goes, but but we've got we're not core in there. We track. We monitor the quality of that water yeah. continuously, daily. So yeah, always more conservative. So we've got evidence to, to support our argument. Yeah. Someone could make an argument <laughs> that yeah, some level of court not going to get any further. But, but um, that, that's, uh, that's a possibility. I'll be worried about the rainwater tank in urban areas. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the same system as what Philip Tutu's got? I would have is that the rainwater, the need for that would be in high and uh, more, and um, the source of the water would be coming from the river, which is pretty under allocated. So, are we factored that in? We might be adding to that in, um, in extreme conditions. That is a, um, an issue that we're going to have to work through. That is the source of the water. Is that is something that we're working through now when it comes to. We have a consent that overrides every other consent. No, we take. Fall in the same, <laughs> same categories <laughs> as, as uh, the hour being being the important um, factor to get that that water. So, it's, it, as Tim said, it's an imperfect system, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a current solution to at least uh, giving a top up supply, especially through these drier. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. I, I did just want to ask, and I guess related to the discussion around, um, I, I guess, community located uh, water supply, um, and please, um, I, I don't remember the, the specific details off the top of my head, but I thought there was a water standards bill or something that came out of Central that meant that we as a regional uh, entity had an obligation in order to not only our supply of water but also to then the, the, the monitoring of water outside of our supply that our, communi our community was having or something like that or, or community was consuming. Um, so uh, it would be great if you're able to, um, to, to speak to that and also like in the, in the uh, how Councillor Krantz had brought up the whole engineers thing like was there a, do we test that water, or is, if, is the homeowners the approximate cost of that, that test? And, um, and I guess an estimation of uh, how much it kind of costs for our Te Karaka community per household for the treatment of that water. Is that, is that out of the, the community? I'm, I'm enjoying having our three waters discussions back on our, uh, back on our agenda. So those are kind of my three chunks of parts over there. Uh, the first one was around the water standards and the obligations kind of regionally. We did, like, it's very clear about the water standard of the water that comes out of Wainaki, right? That's directly from us, high pressure into homes. Those broader ones and then the wider ones around people that are collecting rainwater, was there, was there a water standards bill there? I think that's how much an hour wide. Talmata Arawai. Talmata Arawai is a water regulator, but uh, they've come in, so so they sit, uh, but the legislation supporting it might have been withdrawn, uh, but the intent of the new government is to maintain Talmata Arawai, so the water regulator. Um, they had obligations for water suppliers, which included uh, rural areas, so if it's a marae, if, or if it's a... Um, a farm that supplies others are different ones for single-use <coughs> locations. Uh, but if you're a, 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 
farm and you have the share as cause and then you have a B and B or whatever. Um, there's a different level of obligations. Uh, uncertain where that's uh, sitting now in the, in, in, in the legislation. I think it's just frozen at the time being. The Toma Mata Arawa are all set up for that level and they're a third, are a, they sit, sit separately as a regulator. Uh, so it's a quality regulator and they're, they're intending to bring an economic regulator into the uh, sphere as well right. through ComCom and uh, BIA. Uh, in terms of the testing of that in, in homes, again, is that a, a, an us responsibility or uh, we, a responsibility? We tested it at the gate and in the network. Um, so, so what you did generally get is uh, outside of the treatment plants, we, we always have usually have con sort of continuous monitoring and, and, and a really quite a strict re regime at treatment plants. And then also in your network, you're working on ensuring that um, one challenge of making pipes bigger means water gets there slower. So uh, it ages and the, um, uh, yeah, the chlorine diminishes in it um, during that transfer. So uh, those are tested as a different regime, but those are tested. So we, uh, we, we take care and ensure that it arrives at the customer in a healthy state. Yes. So uh, we take care of our obligations. And, and the estimation of the cost per household that this treatment for, say, Aotearoa is in terms of uh, water, because there, there has been discussion, to give that context, there has been discussion around this table prior to the implementation of free waters about things like Aotearoa and other parts of our community, so it'll be good to kind of, I guess, get in front of that conversation or even to get in the knowledge here in regards to what that means for those Households in terms of costs out there. Is that additional costs? It's, it's within the within their rates, the co the operational costs that for providing that water. Yeah, and, and the, oh, I know it's uh, outside of your guys' brief question, but uh, we must be able to have that figure per household in order to, for say, Rawinia, who's from Rotoria, to go. This is what this would look like for us, Fano, if because this will get brought up as a conversation. It would be a different discussion for because a case by case. Basis, Rotoria would need to be building a treatment plant from scratch, where okay. where if you joined in town, it would be a very low uh, additional, relatively low additional cost because uh, we've got the existing. In, in a Rotoria situation, you've got this massive lift at the front end, and it's how you deal with capital costs and how you deal with operational costs would be similar, a bit more than anywhere else because scale does matter. Um, but the capex cost would be really high. Uh, on for block uh, to, to actually have the infrastructure to be able to do it. Um, if you were aiming to recover costs uh, by the individuals in the households. So, thank, thank you for that. It might be worth a bit of a... That's one thing that I've just realised us as a council hasn't done. I don't think we've gone to go visit the uh, Te Karaka, um, the Te Karaka treatment plant. So yeah, well, we, we have, but I don't think... Us. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I know I already had a turn, but I'm really passionate about water. So, um, but I'll move the paper. That means that I can't get to the um, rules. Um, put it in the beginning because then you get it right as recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have. Sorry, I've been a bit neglectful of moving papers today. Oh, thank you, Kapai. Um, no, I, what I, why I'm sort of asking is about testing water, and it's not necessarily about council treating it. I don't, I don't think council is the be all end all answer for all things, um, although I would love to see more communities have treated water. What I would like to know is um, what it costs to treat one house, what it costs to test one house, what does that cost? Um, and, and I know that you, you can't actually give an estimation of, of treatment, um, but maybe you could give an estimation in terms of volume, a tank load of water, how much does that cost to treat? Because I think it's important for people who are on domestic supply, and most of us in the region outside of the city centre, we are on domestic supply. We're drinking water that comes straight from the sky, that has gone through my dirty drain, and has come up through my dirty tank, and I'm drinking it. And um, I, I just think that even though we're not treating their water, it's not our responsibility 
it, it's a very easy thing for us and our scientists and our water people to potentially put a little bit of information or some links or something that where people can try a bit harder or um, to look after their own health. I know it's not our responsibility to do it, but if we can do, surely that's an easy thing to do to educate people. How much it might cost, where you might go to, to test your water, and where you might go to treat it. That's more of a statement than a question. Thank you. I think we'll have to um, get some information together to assist you with that. But certainly it would help. Uh, the larger the scale it is, uh, you get a lot of efficiency, including the testing. Dollar. Yeah, look, um, these are great systems that can top people up, but there's, there's got to come some self-responsibility in there, and I've always lived on, I'm still living on rainwater tanks, you know, and we make sure we clean the spoutings out at least once, if not twice a year, and clean the tank out every second year, it's not hard to do. Mm. Yeah, you know, if you want clean water, you, it's pretty clean when it comes from the sky, but what's the fastest route to get to you? So, look, there's got to be self, and that's maybe an education thing um, that needs to be pushed a bit more because you know, people are drinking water out of tanks that haven't been cleaned out for years, the spoutings haven't been cleaned out, well, you're not going to get clean water. Um, but if we're doing, these systems are great as a top up, if we're testing it, but at least we're, I think what we've done now is um, put the science together. Um, it's going to be a good responsibility. Further to that, there is really, I'm in out of Wainu, we're on rainwater as well. There's a really easy treatment. You go into Bunnings, you buy a little bottle of treatment water and you chuck it in your tap and it, and it costs $23 and that's 20,000 litres treated. Faceless too. Okay, well, we've done the faceless. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Farada, seconded by Councillor Farhinger. Noting report, all over the paper. Aye, uh, thank you. Right, now we move to our final paper on page 23, the Journeys Infrastructure Projects. And welcome back. Papers read. Just, just a couple of corrections, please. Um, and I'll um, give apologies to our operations manager who drafted a lot of the report. She's unavailable to team today. But just, just on um, uh, paragraph seven, I've put a terminology called boy races. I suppose you could see there there's been a stereotype. If you look at the composition of the males here, they're probably offended. They were probably law abiding <laughs> citizens of their youth. So we'll put a new term. Further term, Bogan. <laughs> in a serious note, um, it gives an update of, of the of the network and we are at the gate. So, willing to take any questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, really, another thing about information. Uh, page thirty twenty six, the trial of the fibre net. Is it more difficult to lay? Is it much more expensive? Is it cost effective? Have we started? Is it going to work? Yeah, but. Um, Okay, through the chair, we've tried it. It is a, um, what it does is with those fibres, and you can see the fibres there, it just binds everything, binds the bitumen together. Yes, it is more expensive, but the information we're getting from other councils is that the life cycle of that chip seal, instead of lasting seven years, they're saying the deterioration, they're probably getting up to 10 to 12 years. So, but there's also the, um, where you place it too. If, like, those roads are low volume roads, I mean, Okay, you're only getting um, uh, cars, you're not getting heavy freight. So, you know, the suggestion is to you know, control another area on a, on a high volume road, and that's when you'll really get some where we think it's safe. That's what it is. It's a specialised equipment, but it is. It comes from Sea Hawks Bay, but um, from the Fulton and Hogan, but, but it just goes around the country. It's just a programming issue. Just like you do have a programming, bring it in, and um, yeah. It does have some constraints, like in temperature, <coughs> when, physically, and when the temperature gets too low. You've got to make sure you give it a, the evidence we're getting, you, you have to make sure you give it a, every opportunity to succeed. Yeah. 
question I've got, and, and, and it's probably not brought up in here, but um, we've got new roading, that roading surface that we're seeing um, on State Isle 1 around um, Otoko and on, on Hori Arbors. Uh, it's beautiful and smooth, and I've seen all the concrete um, bags on the side of the road that are obviously adding so much concrete to them. Is this, is this um, what most of the roads are going to end up looking like? And um, is it way more resilient? Is it going to be maybe stronger over time? Because it's beautiful to drive on. Yeah, I don't want to really answer that on behalf of the SBA. Maybe it's something to give to Linda because, um, yeah, absolutely, that also comes with investment. And yeah. it's good to see the investment here. Yeah. And, and Obviously, from a driver's performance, you're noticing the difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah you do. Yeah. They are targeting areas where, in terms of freight, where um, they've had a lot of historic issues with potholes, and that's obviously the the more investment, and that does cost more than your normal ship deal, yeah. but you, you're going to get a, a lot of better, better product than you are. Sure. And a lot long, longer longevity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's right. Hang it on. Oh, we can, yeah. Yeah. I think they're doing a good job. Yeah. I've a little bit. Okay, um, any other questions? Yeah. Councillor. Uh, so, <laughs> thank uh -huh. you for the report, and yeah, good comprehensive, especially around the Tim Rogan Flux, which is great to see there's a bit of a future mm -hmm. there. Um, having been around a lot of um, the region and been bombarded with comment on um, traffic management and inefficiencies in some of the road crews, a word comment about how you are able to implement traffic management and the uh, feed. Just in, regard, in terms of our project, I say. Um, our operations team look at, they approve the, the traffic management plans and so we've already had a, a meeting with the uh, forestry industry and there was just that in terms of that we've met you now we've got a government directive to start looking at that and so the first option is, is well, 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 and that's um, the Whanganui District Council being very upfront about what they do and it is a road closure it's not a, it's actually a hard closure mm -hmm. and so the, and it lets the teams work in those areas and so you, you, but they are being quite restricted. Like you just can't, can't get in. It's just a bit more comms, and and that's where it's right. And so you're not having to have the people on the stop and go. And that's it. So that's we'll start putting that in. The other things is that we'll start actually um, drafting the traffic management plan. And we'll say the traffic management plan will be this, and so we won't be left up to. I fold a lot of our contracts of finding the traffic management systems in part, so they, they'll give it to a third party. So that's that, what that's what, what I'm seeing in the, you know from most of okay. unless you're a tier one where you've got your own traffic management <laughs> company. And so um, we've spoken to a, a couple of other councils, Marlborough, and they're starting to actually in their contract documents say this is the traffic management plan, so you know what the, the costs are. So those are some of the um, working through. It's just not only us, but we've also got to work through with our other utility providers like gas, uh, and you'll see um, obviously our utility team to make sure there's a consistent thing with that. So that's what um, we've started. And it's the operations team are very, um, I say, there's a big problem. And I was in those conversations too with communities and, and consistent through them with comments on inefficiencies related to health and safety. Um, one thing I would point out here is that the reason for health and safety ultimately is so people go home at night safe. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't raised within the community, so there's a conversation there, and I think there's a gap between both sides. When you're in the road corridor, you're always inches away from um, a, a serious injury or wound. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some of the fundamentals are a little bit lost in the community, we need to lift them up. Yeah, there's a, 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 and maybe rationalise what we're doing on our side. So that's the only other comment I would have in, in that space, that people go home safely. Because when you're in the road corridor, you actually are at risk. You're not in control of what other people do. Um, so that's important, that's recognised as well. Yeah. And it's a tough discussion. Mm -hmm. and, and the second part was some auditing of the efficiency of the job. Uh, we, we do audit uh, efficiency of the, of the job and also recognise that uh, when um, uh, uh, we feel improved.
improvements can be made in efficiency as well. Mm -hmm. It's felt by the team. Uh, uh, we also have to do that in a way where we're walking to we're working towards a goal and, and not being overly reactive on parties out there working for us. We're not at the same position, I think, in the criticism that members of the public are, but we're somewhere on that scale. Um, so, yeah. Yep. So we are wanting to trend towards that. Right, any other questions? No, everyone's all pretty quiet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty good. what a good group of people. It was, it's a good read. Yeah. I'm happy to move the paper. I think it was very informative to make sure all councillors are on the same page and have the same information. Thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Uh, okay, um, that's the end of our paper, so I uh, will declare this meeting closed. Um, we've got no. 12 30. I know, I know I was thinking of that. I just want to talk a little bit before we break for lunch. Um, <coughs> yeah, our thing. Um, I think we're going to do our thing now. You do not know what our thing is. <laughs> Thanks, grab a cuppa. We'll, we, we're still going to talk for a little while. And then look at the